I think we'll get started. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Sometimes we have meetings in here. I know we have our board meetings and cable commission meetings and the sound gets really dead and it's hard for people to hear, but I will, I will project as loudly as possible. I understand we have an audience on Facebook too, right Dave? Right. Th those are the rumors. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Mike Johnson. I am the executive director of uh, the Cable Commission and Northwest Community Television slash CCX Media. We still have our legal name under the Northwest Community Television side of things, but are branded as uh, CCX Media. We want to thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, we have some, obviously, some uh, uh, interesting news to go over, and um, so I'll start off uh, basically giving an overview of uh, of our funding situation and uh, how we got to this point. And then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk more in detail of uh, what he's done w with working with staff and then uh, with uh, Javier um, with more specifics in terms of uh, studio operations. Um, so, what I want to do first off is tell you just a little bit about how we're funded. I think people think that the money is just, you know grows on trees and just, just happens to be out there. We get our funding through a 5% cable franchise fee. And that 5% fee uh, actually goes to the cities and then is turned over to us. We are extremely, extremely fortunate that the cities give us the money in turn to do local programming. In most cities throughout the country, this is not the case. In fact, most cities just keep the money and put it into snow plowing, general fund budget, and don't put it into community TV at all, period. Um, if, you, if you go around the country, and I sit on a national board called the Alliance for Community Media, people who look at this center go, wow, you guys have got the best you know, funding situation of all these other systems. They just don't have the funding out there. Uh, that we have. But we are primarily funded one way and only one way and that is mainly through this cable franchise uh, TV fee which is 5% of the gross revenue and that is based on the number of subscribers within the northwest suburbs of Minneapolis here. That funding does not include any revenue that the cable company makes on internet. So the internet is where their growth, uh, all the cable companies are seeing massive, massive amount of growth in internet revenue. So although Comcast is bleeding cable subscribers, they're seeing an uptick in internet subscribers. Federal law does not allow us to get any of that internet revenue. And I can guarantee you if we did get that revenue from the internet, we wouldn't be sitting here today. In fact, life would be very, very good because we would have a significant amount of money for the foreseeable future because everybody, for the most part, needs internet. In fact, Comcast even offers an internet essentials program for people who are less fortunate that for a very reduced rate they will provide internet service because internet service today is almost equivalent to the telephone line in the, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Everybody needed a landline. Well, the internet, if you don't have internet, you're, you're pretty much um, not on the information superhighway, as they say. And what's happening now is a lot of this information, a lot of the programming is streamed over the internet. So what we're experiencing is what's called cord cutting. Cord cutters are not technically cutting the cord. What they're doing is, is uh, discontinuing their traditional uh, cable television packages and then um, uh, putting that money into, say, streaming boxes like Roku or Apple TV or uh, Amazon Fire, those types of things. And, and that in itself is uh, a very, very big concern. And just over the last two years alone, uh, between uh, end of 17, all of 18, and up to this point, we're talking about a loss of nearly $600,000. That's a significant amount of money. And I'm also here to tell you that that money is never coming back. If anything, this money will continue to go down more and more and more. So I'm not bringing you any good news in terms of our future uh, uh, situation, in terms of our, our funding. Uh, but we do have a plan. 
but the plan is going to take a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort to diversify our revenue. You should also know that in some of your cities, for those of you who live in the northwest suburbs, some of the cities have well under 50% of the people who even have cable anymore. Some are down to 30%, 33%. In the old days, it was up to 60%. And that number is going to continue. We only have one city now that's over 50%. Only by 1%. It was like 51%. And I predict that city will be below 50% within a couple of months. And that's just the trend. So um, in addition to that, we do get uh, some additional funding called the PEG fee, which is $1.36 per month per subscriber. But as the subscriber numbers go down in traditional cable TV, those numbers go down. And so when I give you these numbers, that's, that's total between the franchise fee and the, uh, the community TV fee. Um, so in, in terms of these losses, it's totally not sustainable. So back in uh, uh, 2018, we put money in the budget to do a strategic long-term strategic plan process for long-term financial uh, sustainability. Because, uh, you know, the handwriting was on the wall. We're going, okay, this is interesting. We're, you know, we knew at some point there was going to be a tipping point. Because cable subscriber loss has actually been going on for a very long time. It's just, it's just accelerating now. We've been losing subscribers uh, since about what was that, 2010 or, I mean, that was like the high point and it just kept going down from there. The problem is, is it's just going, you know, uh, more direct down, downward. So, um, so that's why we have to uh, basically diversify our revenue and through this, diver uh, through this strategic plan, we um, figured that we're going to have to look at the entire operation uh, all departments, and no department is immune to any changes down the road here. Now, we had a situation where Barb was uh, retiring, and, you know, one of my goals here and, through, and the board is, you know, let's try to keep people employed here as best as possible. Keep them employed, um, and keep create, okay? So create operations, most often known as public access operations in many cities have well, first and foremost, uh, community TV in general is not in the majority of cities across this country, okay? This is, there are pockets where it's very, uh, it, it's more uh, prominent, you know, mainly on the East Coast in the, in the state of Massachusetts, in Minnesota, and in uh, areas on the West Coast. Uh, certainly there are pockets in between. But I would say that there's more, many more cities that have no community, and when I say community TV, I mean everything, whether it's public educational, government access, they don't, they don't have it. They simply, if there is a franchise fee, they simply keep it uh, and put it in the general fund. And we have been blessed that our cities have uh, funded us this entire time without cutting any of the funding back. And if we didn't do all the services that we do for the cities, whether it's the news programming that they uh, uh, thoroughly enjoy and have, uh, uh, they, they will rebroadcast all these stories on their channels, or the connection program where we work with cities on specific municipal programs or doing all their city council coverage, uh, and then all the events we do out uh, on site, uh, on location. If none of that was done, we don't know. I mean, the cities would just say, well, what are you doing for us? You know, what, 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 have you, what, what kind of services are you offering us? Or how many people are doing, how many people in my city, in my city alone? If I have a city of 60,000 people, how many, city, how many people in my city are actually using create facilities? Something they would ask if, you know, in times of, it's just like, okay, so you have 60,000 people and 10 people are using it, you know, those are things that, that govern, the decision makers think about. It's just like, okay, well, does this make sense or does it not make sense? So what we need to do is address the gaps between our current staffing and our future needs. And like I said, we need to diversify our revenue. And so we're going to have to 
you know, put some people on these teams to help do that, to help drum up support, marketing teams, teams to go out and do things for hire, rent out facilities, um, do commercial production. We do have, we are blessed in some respects as well that we have a local origination channel which is different than a public access channel. The local origination channel allows us to do straight up advertising so we can sell that channel. And so all these things that we need to do in order to become, not become, but to maintain uh, financial uh, sustainability is uh, there to even and to keep create going as well. So we're going to need to make money in different departments and different, uh, for different reasons to support create, to support the other departments, um, because the money is just going to keep going down. In fact, I just have, uh, I can't really share like cable subscription, like specifics, but the, these last two, two um, bars here show the last two years in terms of going in there. In fact, I want to thank Sue Ellen for saying, you got to put those numbers in the red because they stand out more. Because when I first went over these charts with uh, Charlie and Sue Ellen and Mary LaHaye, she said, you know, you really should make those stand out. So instead of making them blue, make them red because that's exactly what it is. It's a loss. It's not a gain. And then, like I said, that money is not coming back and and even to make up even to make up for what's been lost so far is a huge undertaking to try to to try to make six hundred thousand dollars here locally that's just what's been lost up to this point is a major 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 deal and that's why we have to try to ramp up and try all kinds of things to bring in money so um, local centers uh, in this area, some of them have just, they don't even offer public access or create. You know, Quad Cities doesn't. Roseville just cut out all their public access. St. Paul Neighborhood Network cut it back drastically. Um, not even closely funded to the way we are even now and into the future. But our goal is to keep it operating. So in order to keep it operating, we will have to make some changes because we cannot, we cannot operate as status quo. But we think that you know the powers that be uh, here who work within these departments uh, have come up with a plan to preserve uh, community TV um, for the long term, uh, as long as we can. I mean, there's no, you know, we we've been in the, we've been operating here in the northwest suburbs since 1982, and quite honestly, the last two years is the first time where we've ever seen significant losses. But we know. The handwriting's on the wall, that money's not coming back and it's going to continue to go down. So we have to take these steps like right now. And with Barb leaving, um, you know, it, through attrition, we will most likely not replace uh, people as they leave uh, because that is, uh, quite honestly, the easier way uh, and, the, and the more painless way to, to save money if people retire or decide to go on to another job. So uh, it just so happens that Barb did announce her retirement. So although that retirement announcement triggered maybe a, um, a quicker move on some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, we would have done this regardless because the money situation um, is bleak going forward. And one thing I failed to mention before I pass this on to Dave Kaiser to talk more of the specifics is, um, is you know, I forgot that very important point uh, r related to uh, uh, funding. But when I th if I think of it, I'll come back uh, to you with that. Um, before I pass it on to Dave, is there any questions that people have or do you want to, should we wait to the end on questions? I'd say go ahead while budget topic. Okay. Up. Does anybody have any questions about the financial situation? Well, what's the uh, contract we're under now? Was it, uh, a few years ago, it sounded like we had like a 10-year contract. So Correct. Often five, six, seven years. Yes. That's good. That's a good question. So we, oh, is there? Just repeat the question. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, Richard Claddy asked, like, what is the contract? What he is referring to is the franchise agreement. So we do have an agreement with the cable company, and it's a 10-year agreement which um, started in 2014 and will go to 2024. But that agreement does not, um, 
The agreement does not uh, promise anything in terms of future revenue. All it promises is that you will get 5% of the pie, whatever the pie is. Unfortunately, a lot of that pie is being eaten up, going away to other services that uh, are not uh, the, the kind of funding that we do not get. But um, so we will actually, I think within, let's see, we're, we'll be 2020 next year, within two years, we will be uh, contacting the cable company and start lining up meetings and things because what we like to do is, is um, uh, meet well in advance, like one or two years in advance, and start a negotiation process. Uh, and some cities in the, in the metro area right now are, are, are under negotiations. It all depends on when their franchise agreement took place. But I'm not sure the nature of the question, but that's when it, when it is, nor will any new franchise agreement necessarily bring us any more money. Because my biggest concern, and I did think of that other point, so thank you for asking that question. My other point is the FCC. I talked a little bit about just the funding. The FCC, Federal Communications Commission, is not very friendly um, to community television operations right now. Um, I have actually been to the FCC twice and have met with FCC commissioners trying to promote the qualities of things that we're doing here with community TV and tell them that how important it is. Well, um, we had two commissioners who were very interested in hearing what we ha uh, had to say and three of them who didn't because they don't necessarily care about community TV. They're more about, you know, they're, they, they tend to listen to the people who have more money, which is the, which is the communications industry. I don't want to just say cable because there's satellite, cable, the, the wireless industry. All is governed by the FCC. So that is another thing that most of the other centers are really worried about. And I'm worried about it too. I'm very worried about it because they, they could come down with, the, there, is, there is a law right now that says, well, they can start charging all the schools and the cities for the cable service. They can start charging us for any time they fix a cable that's tied to any of our buildings, the studio facilities. And one of the things they were talking about is possibly um, charging us for the use of the channels. You know, like what, what is the value of a public access channel? So if they say, well, the value is, well, just say $350,000. Well, then they would subtract $350,000 from our franchise fee payments because they say that's what it's worth and it's an income, you know, it's just like, and that's what we're going to take off the top. So we're going to fight that very hard, uh, both from NATOA, which is uh, the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, the League of Cities, which is a good group to have behind us to fight that, and then uh, Alliance for Community Media and several other groups that are fighting the FCC. And our organization has contributed financially to, to help in this fight. So, you know, think, think, of, think of the, um, the telecom industry, which includes the cable companies, uh, the broadcasters, wireless industry, all the streamers that, you know, there, you know, just say this is like a, a bar right here from floor to where my hand is, that's the kind of money they have to lobby in Washington, D.C., okay? So when little Mike Johnson from the Northwest suburbs and several other people from across the country go and lobby, we don't get paid, we're, we're just your average everyday Joe, well, what we're, we're, up against, we're up against this, and we're way, 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 way down here. And so it's, it's one of those things, it's like David and Goliath trying to, fight the, trying to fight the industry. So we don't know what's going to happen there, but I've often said to my employees in multiple uh, memos over the last year, is my biggest concern is cord cutting. It, we have no control over it. We can't stop it. It's going to continue. And because we're um, so tied to these fees, and the fees have been, I'm not gonna lie, the fees have been very good over the years. But that's all changing, and it's all diminishing, and it's not gonna stop. So, are there any other questions I can answer? Yes? Just to try to get some clarification on what we were just saying about the FCC. Yep. Well, I've got some other questions, but yep. why is the FCC against public 
television? I guess I'm trying to figure out the yeah, battles because the there's well, no money. It, yeah, it's all about, everything boils down to money. So the cable industry um, are the ones who really came forward and pretty much lobbied the FCC. So really it's more of a cable company thing, but they've convinced at least three of the commissioners that they want to they want to make some changes in the federal in the federal law and, and again we're gonna fight we have some really good attorneys though on on our side who have some very good legal arguments to fight the FCC and right now uh, this will be fought out in court this issue with the FCC will be fought out in court in the in the sixth district sometime in 2020 we presume I mean sometimes the courts move slow are these commissioners local people? Nope. No, they're, na they're, they're appointed. So and typically it's, it's, it's uh, they're political appointments and typically, uh, so in, for instance, if you have a Republican in power, they would have the majority. They still, typically there will be like, uh, uh, the majority of the members would be uh, Republican appointed and then there would be two uh, minority appointed for the Democratic Party. And, um, so they're in Washington? Yeah, Washington, D.C. Right on 12th sucks. Street. If anybody wants to go there with me and <laughs> pound on the on the lectern, um, they yeah, you can look them up. And just go to FCC.gov, and they, they cover a lot of things. I mean, even when you think about it, even when we're there, we're just like this tiny little thing. It's like okay, that's community TV. I mean, they're doing everything in terms of communication. Like wireless is so big. The wireless industry is huge. Telephony uh, slash telephone is big. The cable industry in general, satellite, anything that's done through communications, whether it's wired or wireless, the Federal Communications Commission is responsible for in terms of any regulation and things. You had some more questions? Well, I don't know if I should wait until after. If you have questions Dave related knows? to that, time slots and all that, that'll be Dave, but I, I can answer cool. anything with revenue, FCC, cord cutting. Well, you mentioned the station that allows commercials. Yep. So is that currently active? Yes, and that is our, and we have actually sold commercials in the past until a cable company asked us if we would be in a partnership with them because we just happened to be going after the same customers they were locally, car dealerships, you know, that type of thing. Yes, it's basically uh, channel 799 or channel 12 on the cable system, and um, that is our LO channel. That's where our news, sports, oh. and events, all, the, all that content can, can have traditional advertising on it. So how would some of our shows be able to qualify to be on that channel if we can help bring in money? Um, well, that might that that, that that might be possible, um, and there might be underwriting possibilities too, mm -hmm. which could be on the traditional create channel. And that's an excellent question, a great observation, because um, you can you know a, as money tightens up, you know because things are good, right? Everything's good. Or nobody had to worry about money. But now you could go, well, wait a second, I wonder like if I do my show, if I'm doing the polka show, can I get an accordion company or some, mm -hmm. you know, or somebody to, to help underwrite this program to help you know, pay for it somehow and somehow you know, I have some type of contribution to this organization to keep it going. Mm -hmm. um, that's what, you know, that's what we would, would need to look at at some point. But yes, you can do, we can look at sponsorships and those types of things. And then the so that'll be like for another meeting because I really like to hear about that because on our show I'd like to start getting advertisers to well we have to be careful mm -hmm. when you say tr advertisers or underwriting supporters and then we have to look at is the money for the person doing the show or to help support the organization I mean I would think if we figure out some way for that money to come back right like here. maybe there would be some type of Right, you know, and I, I'm just thinking out loud, some type of rental fee for the studio, but then there would be some type of mix, I, and I can understand something so like I'd that. I'd just like to hear more about that yeah. going forward. And we, yeah, we would need to talk further and, and think that through, because we're, we're still in the, we're literally still in the process. We've got a long ways to go. Uh, we're meeting internally with staff uh, over all kinds of things. Dave is coordinating those meetings and talking about every potential idea. And if any of you guys have ideas, Bring them forward to myself or Dave. Uh, Dave is coordinating these meetings, and because uh, we'd like to hear them, we'd like to hear them. Anything that you know, because we're we like to think we, we we're, you know we're thinking of everything, but it's great to hear people come out and say, "Hey, have you thought about this? Or have you thought about that?" 
in terms of uh, uh, support down the road. And then I'm sorry, this, well, I'm not sorry, but. No, no, I don't know, it's I, too much time. nobody can, that's official, <laughs> nobody can be so sorry, sorry here. So the other question, and as I just thought it through, I think I figured out why it won't work, but is there a way that that channel that can have sponsorship or commercials can be on like one of the antenna TV channels? I know it can't because that'll violate probably the agreement with the cable companies. Yeah. But it, some way because if, like I can't even on my TV go and get our channels to see my own shows. So well, right. And yeah, you were talking like, yeah, if we, uh, so let's just say we got a low, um, low power broadcast signal or something like that. We can go maybe two miles from the studio or three miles or, or um, somehow worked out some arrangements with uh, public TV. You know, I used to, I, oof, gosh, this goes way, way back. 1980, 81, and 82, there was a, a person who worked over in Fridley, she's a volunteer, Mary Hansen, does a, did a program on um, uh, various topics. So she's, she does a kind of a quasi public access show over at MTN Studios in Minneapolis, and her program is on is on uh, public television on one of their extra channels. You know, I think yep, public TV ha had some uh, additional licensing to to have more channels for a variety of programming, and it's simply called the Mary Hansen Show. And I was her first director when I first started out right out of college. They, they go. What should we call this show? I said, how about the Mary Hansen Show? And it's still the same name today. And uh, I, I directed, I think, our first 120 shows, and then I, I came out here when this uh, system started. So yeah, we're, we're gonna have to just take a look at everything. But I do wanna say this, and this is a very critical thing to know and to do. Again, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're losing, the, 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 cable, the cable company is losing more and more subscribers, but people still have internet. I would say probably 95% of the people in Northwest suburbs have high-speed internet in one form or another. And then they're getting their streaming services. So we have to think about, uh, you know, outside the box, we've been doing it a lot on, you know, on the other side of the building, and, and we're always telling people in Create, get your content. Um, I just met uh, with you uh, last week about getting your content out on the internet, get, getting links out there, because that's how people are watching content. I watch a lot of content right on this little device here. I don't do, I, I hardly ever, unless it's a sporting event, I'll sit, I'll sit and watch a live Vikings game, Twins, Timberwolves game, hockey. Other than that, it's all time shifted or on demand on my phone. People's attention spans are very short when yes. watching things on the internet. Yes. I just hope that at some point we can figure out how to get on TV old school because people will watch a 30 minute show or a full show if it's on TV they might get up and back and forth but on the internet two minutes maybe tops well so it, it depends on how, oh, what the you're right in some, in some of it is yeah we're, we're, we're growing up in a world with more and more short attention spans you know I grew up in a time where there was no cable, there was no, none of this stuff, and you know, you'd rely on the six o'clock news, you'd sit down and do appointment viewing. But that, that train, you know, it's kind of left the station, and there's still quality programming out there to watch and sit down and watch in your good old fashioned TV, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is you need to expand, your, if you're not doing it, you need to be out there developing an audience and uh, an interest, right. so even if people help support you in the future, they're gonna wanna know, well, who's watching this? Is anybody watching this? Well, there's uh, 50,000 people who have cable in the Northwest suburbs, but I have no idea how many people are watching it. But if you put it on, if you put it on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, you get counts. You get, you get counts of how many people are watching. And potential supporters want to know that. Now, there will always be a supporter out there that's supporting either our organization or an individual show just for the sake of a feel-good support. Like, I will support Richard Claddy because he's a good guy and he's got a great cause. Uh, but there will be a lot of others who go, well, who's watched? How many people have you got? How many eyeballs are out there? Now, we don't want to be just tied to eyeballs, because I understand that. I mean, you don't want, you don't want to do programming just, well, I need the highest. That's what the, the problem with YouTube. And YouTube, I often say, 
is probably the biggest create channel in the entire world because it is just everything is there and everybody's going there. And that's why it's important to be there. You gotta be where people are, are, are going to find you. And again, it's value added for our cable subscribers. If they can't see your program at this particular time slot because they, again, I always say that stars and the planets have to be aligned perfectly for them to sit down at, what time is your show on, Sue Ellen? Five. Five o'clock. What, what time? Five o'clock on Sunday. Five p.m. on Sunday, okay? So Sue Ellen has to cross her fingers roll the dice and just hope that everybody's going to tune in right at five o'clock on Sunday or hope that they have a DVR so they can time shift it. Yeah. So a lot has to happen. At 1 or 9 yeah, or watch the repeats at one in the morning. So that's why the internet is a blessing in some respects is because you, you, you now have the power to take that programming and distribute it out and develop your own little audience and get it out there in addition to what's going on in the channel. So I don't want to diminish the channels. But what I said at the very beginning of this meeting is we're having less and less cable subscribers. And, uh, and eventually, we could be uh, somewhere down the road, there may not be any more traditional cable subscribers. Yes? Mike, I know that there's an old axiom that says that a little bit of information is dangerous. And I, I feel sometimes, and tonight's one of them, like I have just a little bit of information. Yep. To gain more information, where can the average person go to get information about the financials for this entity, both in terms of revenue that's coming in and also how that revenue gets divided between the create side and the rest of the building. In addition to that, what about the percentages of cuts that are coming from this side of the building and the percentages of cuts that are coming from, from elsewhere? All good questions and that, uh, that would be th through me, you know, in terms of, you know, we can sit down and go over you know, the actual financials. I will say this, that all the money we've lost so far is enough to just wipe out the entire create department, just like that. And that and, that, and those losses are gonna continue. So, um, uh, but yes, that would be me. And uh, certainly we can look at, we could look at ways of how to best disseminate that information going forward. Um, I'm just, I am, I'm up here giving you, you know, straight up answers in terms of what the future is if we don't make changes here. Whether it, whether it comes out of one department or the other, the money is gonna still keep going down and we need people here on staff to create revenue in one form or another. We don't do that, we're out of business. Is there is there any sense of uh, where the priorities exist as far as the news side of uh, CCX versus the create side? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think uh, um, the the organization first started from a standpoint. There were two two founders, Ray, uh, Ray Stockman and Jack Irving. Their plaques are on the wall on the other side of the building, and they often felt that. Uh, that you know, Ray lived in Golden Valley. He had a major television station right in his backyard called Care 11, and he and he was pretty much. And this is how the whole organization started. He said, "We've got stories to tell. We've got lots and lots of stories to tell in our communities, and they're not being told." And so there was a strong uh, emphasis of wanting to do you know, news and tell stories and continue to tell stories as many as possible. Hyperlocal news. Hyperlocal news. And we've got one of the best operations in the country, I'm, bar none. People have come here from all over the country looking at how we're doing hyperlocal news. I doubt if, the, you, you know, and, and all that could go away if we can't fund it, right? I mean, it, 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 when all is said and done, if we can't generate revenue, Wherever money goes, it's, well, there's going to be less and less of it to go if we don't generate money. Let's just put it that way. But yes, hyperlocal news is a big thing and strongly supported by our cities. And so, um, yeah. Mike, I can maybe hop in. Yeah. Trudy, am I okay to stand back here to talk? Yeah. We're good. As we look at the different areas in CCX Media, one of the things we're looking at is what are the buckets of potential income as we go down the road? What are the sources that might supplement some of that loss in cable income? And as we look at that, we look at 
for hire work as a possibility. We think we have the ability to rent the truck, to have ENG shooters shoot pieces for businesses, for local nonprofit groups, possibly renting parts of the facility. So we think that's a potential big bucket. Another big bucket is commercial sales or sponsorships on the CCX1 channel where we can sell ads. And one of the things that's key to selling those ads is to have strong viewership. And to have strong viewership on that channel, we need people watching the news program, we need people watching the sporting events. So that's why those areas, as we look forward, we have to keep those strong as far as the output they're doing because that's what advertisers are going to look at and want to have spots around to continue to sell. The other area is obviously the cities and we continue to think the city bucket is going to be there through whatever cable subscribers we have. So if we keep continue to support the cities, that money will come from the cities then to us. So that's why we do the connection, that's why we do all the council meetings and need all the staff in that area to do that. So I think that's part of the explanation of why those areas are really crucial as we look forward and look at what are our options, biggest options to offset some of the revenue. It's those areas that will help us then go out and sell things to advertisers. So hopefully that helps out a little and, bit. And keep Create going. Again, we... Exactly. It, it all has to... We have to generate the revenue. I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but if we don't do it, we're all out of business, all departments, period. I have uh, two questions. First of all, um, do we know if the cities, they're, they're collecting the money from the cable companies, paying fees, whatnot, uh, do we get 100% of that money or are they keeping some of it? Uh, they, we get 100%, but we also give money back to them in the form of grants. Um, they insist that some of that money has to go back to them in order to uh, fund their equipment for their city halls. I mean, it's all um, a le legitimate request to keep the, because when all is said and done, let's just say all of this <laughs> goes away, so God forbid it does, because I love, I mean, I, I've, I've been in this business my entire life, so I want to do whatever we can to help save it. So, um, the, the cities, um, when all is said and done, even if we weren't here, the cities would probably continue doing um, their council meetings. Uh, just from the standpoint, I mean, we have a council member in here right now, and a board member, a commissioner, who, you know, they have, you, you can't go backwards and not be, on, not be on TV, right? It's all about transparency. Your, your, your viewers in your cities are going to expect that you're still going to be transparent in terms of your government operations. So, in the doomsday scenario, if everything's gone, I still, I still predict that the cities would have to still continue to do their, their program. You had another question. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. You know, you mentioned earlier that there, a lot of places don't have this right. because the city's pocketed. So exactly. I, and I, I appreciate hearing that the cities are, no, I haven't been on the board. I know they're very supportive. Right. We have st city staff on all, all the board members, you know, or most of them are city staff yep. from the various cities. Um, the second question is, Comcast does make, they have the Spotlight, I think it's called, is their local broadcasting thing. Yeah. Where do they make their ads? Could they make them here? Or if they're, are they making it some, some other place where they're paying them money? And they they, may, they, and they have a money? local team, although they cut that back drastically. In fact, Dave and I met with one of their ad sales uh, managers not too long ago, and they're, they're, uh, they're cutting back and changing the ways they're doing things. They're going more in the digital world and even having people create their own little ads and putting them on the TV. If you go to uh, Comcast Spotlight um, on the Internet, you can see how they're they're, they've changed uh, how they do things and in terms of how they're going to start selling ads in the future. And, um, and we've sold it. And Dave was in charge of all of our advertising several years ago. And we brought in several hundred thousand dollars from s strict advertising um, when we were doing it back then. And that was before doing anything on the internet. Now with the internet, we can tell, we can tell uh, advertisers how many clicks and views there are as well to help support um, the programming. Just well, to follow no, up to that, I'll mention yeah. that that's a great idea and that is a possibility <coughs> because Spotlight is using some freelance producers to do that work for them. So they aren't doing all of it no. themselves and could they look to us as a potential place to have s commercials produced that would air on all of the Comcast channels? Definitely a possibility mm -hmm. in the for hire realm of what yeah. we would do. Uh, one more question and I'll turn it over to Dave. Yes. 
can you, oh, your ahead. board consider inviting other cities into this? For example, St. Louis Park. Uh, would your board be receptive to that? Well, St. Louis Park, uh, all their franchise fees go, I mean, I, the, this, I think the city collects most of those franchise fees. In fact, I know some people who work for the city of St. Louis Park, and they go towards their, um, they do a lot of, uh, like, government programming and things like that. Wouldn't they be better off linked up with us? I don't know. I don't know if our, I, I understand what you're saying, and, we, and, you know, we have talked about some of our, um, uh, contiguous cities to the northwest suburbs like Rogers who happens to be on this system but is not paying fees we can look at things like that at one point we talked about bringing Champlin into the fold they were part of the quad city and are part of the quad city system but I think there was a lobbying effort from the three other cities north of the river and over Anoka and Ramsey that said hey please don't leave because we need you you know, because there are strength in numbers, right? And that's kind of the argument you're trying to make. If we can bring in more cities, we would have more revenue. Can they see it's better, they're better off if, if all four of their cities join us? Uh, if all, you're talking about the Quad Cities? Yeah. If they joined our organization? Yeah. Well, I don't know. We'd have to offer, uh, does that bring us in more money? We would still have to do all their council meetings. We still have to do all their programming. So what is the, is we'd have to go, okay, what is the net gain then to help support creating those types of things? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I mean, um, is that, that is something, that's story? just, yeah, it's, it's something we've talked about in the past. Um, it, it would, it will be a major uphill climb to bring, to, to try to bring on more cities that already are somewhat established. I, I know the executive director of Quad Cities, and I can tell you right now, uh, at least in that system, I, I, I doubt if they would come onto our system, it would be one big, big fight at this point. Because they're looking at their own, you know, obviously some people might have to be let go there, for, you know, if you try to merge and all that. But that brings up another thing, and, then I'll, and I'm gonna kinda get on it, because I've, I've talked way longer than I originally planned. Mm -hmm. We also have to look outside the northwest suburbs too for potential revenue, like when Dave was talking about uh, bringing in revenue for advertising. We, we might even uh, uh, start a, a drone service and you know offering um, uh, uh, aerial footage and being able to do it professionally and, and those types of things. But who's to say we have to stop within the northwest suburbs? Why can't we go out to other areas and offer these services? So. If we could get more money from the outside to help support what you guys are doing, that's what really matters in the end. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and talk about more of the things you really wanna hear. Take it away, Dave. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. He definitely had the hard job with all the budget information, but that's been something we've been looking at for many, many years and we'll continue to look at as that process moves along. I wanted to give you a little background of some of the things we're doing with the strategic plan to look ahead, to look at some of the areas of possible revenue, and also talk a little bit about some of the work that's been done related to the Create Hours and how we're looking at this side of the facility. So a couple things to mention. A really good news note is that the staff that we have with CREATE is outstanding and I don't have to tell you that. You all know how talented these people are and as we look ahead, these talented people are going to be very instrumental in all of the areas that we work in. So don't think if they're not working in CREATE, they're not being valuable to the organization and not helping fund CREATE because that's what we're looking at is how can we use their talents, how can we all work together to make some things that are going to generate some income. So from the hour standpoint, I'll mention a couple of steps we took. We reviewed the facility use stats over the last few years. So Barb and I spent a lot of time looking at the numbers for people coming in. What were the times people were editing? What were the times that the studio was used? How many hours were there and what would we need as far as staff to utilize or to fulfill all of those hours that we were open? And so as we looked at that, we started to think of some models that might work. And then we gave a guideline to the CREATE staff and said, we think it's about this pocket of hours that makes sense of how the hours should be open, how many hours should be open and what we'd need staff for. And then we said to Javi and the rest of the staff, 
Give us three options. Take a look at, within that number of hours of being open, what would be options of the best days, the evenings, the weekends to potentially be open. They came back with some ideas of three options, and then we looked at that, did some fine tweaking to it, and then that's what you see presented on the sheet after a month or so of work of talking about what does it look like, what would be the steps to go forward, we came up with that. When we first came up with those hours then, we met with the board representatives, so Charlie, Sue Ellen, and Mary met with us and we talked a little bit about not only what Mike just presented to you, the capital and the uh, budget situation, but also we talked about the hour options and they gave us some very good input related back to what about this, would this be an option? We talked about the Friday of would Friday be one that we could potentially have part of the day on Friday open and so that's why we're looking at February to open up half of the day on Friday as well again with suggestions from the staff and from the board members. So those will be the hours as we move ahead as far as the department structure I will supervise the create area as well as the other areas that I supervise as well. So I kind of am the umbrella over the staff in all of the four areas that we have here at CCX Media. Javi will coordinate the day-to-day -day work of the facility and also coordinate the contact with the volunteers and the production assistants. And then Trudy will be the one that will be doing some of the clerical administrative work that we have through the create side. There's a lot that happens behind the scenes, which I'm sure you know about the scheduling, some of the file transferring. Trudy will be working with that and also the promotional end to help make sure we do get the message up about create. We let people know it's an opportunity that they can come in and use the studio. So that's a little bit of the staffing structure within CREATE as we move forward. But your CREATE staff that have worked with you for years will continue to work and they already are in a number of ways. We have set up four work groups related to the strategic plan to help us look at possible ways to increase revenue, increase the notoriety of CCX Media. Those groups are fund development. So we've had people meeting, we're on our third meeting now to talk about what are areas we can look at related to fund development and Javi is part of that group. Branding, marketing, PR. We're looking at ways and something in the strategic plan is there's still a lot of people that don't know what CCX Media is and might not know what benefit they could get from it if they watched. And so Nikki and Trudy are part of that group along with staff people from our cities, with our sports, and with our news. Everyone in the whole organization is part of these work groups divided into different areas. We've got a for hire work group. That is the group that's talking about how could we rent the facility? How could we rent the truck? How could we rent ENG equipment? And we have done some of this already. So we have worked with Prudential. We worked with the Anoka Hennepin School District on some pilots where they've actually hired us to come out and use our truck, telecast something for them, edit something for them. So it's already happening. We have some models that we're working on and what we need is more staff availability to see those things grow. So Dustin and Tamisha are part of that group. And the last part is commercial production, sponsorships and pay to play. So opportunities for people to buy time on the channel, whether it be through commercials or sponsorships, to be able to talk about their products or services. So traditionally what we did in the years past related to commercial production, which we did, we had producers here, and again we had staff that sold it, and so we're looking at bringing on a salesperson to work with that part of our operation as we move forward. And I love the idea about the possibility of working with Comcast Spotlight because again, we did compete with them back in the day and it came to a point where they said we think we can do it for you and we'll give a cut of what we sell on your channel and so we said sounds like a pretty good deal let's see how that works out didn't work out as well as we hoped it would because we were down the ladder of their sales priority and so we've said we'd like to take it back we're gonna take it back and we think we can sell much more than you ever sold on our channel and get back to what we did in the past and even higher numbers than that so that is a look at the staffing as we go forward. I'm open to any questions you might have and then next is going to be Javi to talk a little bit about the work that staff has done related to the time slots and as we look forward to create and how the hour structure would be set up. Any questions that I can answer for you?
Certainly, certainly a possibility, and we have models. We've looked at models of other facilities that do that, not only here in Minnesota, but also in other states. So we, we look at that as a possibility, but quite frankly, it's not one of the top things on our list because we're looking at the greatest potential related to some of these. And again, we think that for hire and the commercial sales will be the bigger buckets that we look forward to. And is it worth the price people would have to pay to use the facility as to the income that we would get in from that. So we've thought about it and we're looking at that as a potential option. If things get bad. If things get really <laughs> bad. Again, but what's the total income you could make from that? Is it going to be enough to help support and keep staff and do capital things? Probably buy coffee. <laughs> coffee might be a possibility. <laughs> Clean the help. carpet once a month, right, or something <laughs> like that. Change a light bulb. So, but good thought. Good thought. Something we're looking at. Yes, Bill. Is there any consideration of seeking grants from foundations? We have definitely talked about that as well. And again, we have talked to some other systems that do that. We were just on a phone call the other day, Mike and Steve and I, with Montgomery County in Maryland to learn a little bit about how they work with grants. And what we've learned is there are positives and negatives to the world of grants. Uh, you can get locked into specifically what that grant is about and it might veer from your mission of what you're here to do and eat up a lot of staff time. So that's a concern we'd have related to grants, but we're looking at possibilities. There are some options out there. The American Journalism Project is something that's going on related to foundations and grants that are seeing local news operations, print, but also digital, going away. And they're saying, Let's raise some funds to help local organizations continue to or start up delivering news. So that's an option. It's not a direct grant that I think you're talking about, but it's another option that's out there that we're looking at all of those possibilities. Good. That's in our fund development group. They have talked about that. Any other questions? I can, yeah, Charlie. Um, talking about if you're doing in-house commercials, is that going to interrupt the already precious studio time we're, we're going to have? No. Okay. We certainly, as we looked at the structure of the hours going forward, that there would be some time available that we would be able to potentially use this side of the building for commercial production if we needed to, or possibly rent portions of the building out. We are looking at the studio where the news is done to see if potentially the opposite side of that from the news set might be able to use in some for higher capacity potentially podcast capacity is something we're looking at and something that is growing. So we're turning all of those stones over, Charlie, just to see what's under there and what might be possibilities. But no, we certainly feel comfortable with the hours that we've talked about related to create programming that those would be for create producer use. All right, at this time then, let me hand it over to Javi. You all know Javi, and Javi has been working hard with staff related to how we look at the time going ahead here in the studio and staff has met multiple times related to the slots and the hours so Javi if you want to talk a little bit about how the slots have been talked about and also the process for people if they want to have a regular slot what they need to do. Yeah so I'm just going to start off with January 6th is going to be the new time slot so we've already sent an email out and if you uh, if you haven't seen it, they are they are in front, um, and I think they're on everybody's chair there. So Mondays, of course, we're going to be closed. We're going to be we used to be open seven days a week. Now we're open five days a week. Um, it says starting February 2020 on Friday, we are only going to be open for editing and pickup for equipment, but not studio times. Um, a few key points are going to be going forward. It's just going to be Trudy and I kind of working on the create side. You might see Dustin, Nikki, and Tamisha, but they're probably going to be working on other projects. So if you see them doing uh, a project, they're probably running back and forth, but they're probably not going to be in the create side. You know what I mean? So if you need anything, come to me. I'm probably going to be the one helping you out the most or just uh, around, okay? Um, and also, we are, uh, like I said, we are going to be short. It's going to be Trudy and I, and I would say be prepared uh, when you have a studio production. Time is precious. 
uh, be courteous to other volunteers because you only have a two hour time slot for, for productions now. Um, in this in this piece of paper, as you can see, we're open on Tuesdays. One uh, uh, studio time will be one one p.m. to three p.m. and then three p.m. to five p.m. five p.m. to seven p.m. Each each of those time slots don't doesn't have a designated studio. So if you're like I just want A or B, or if you want A from one to three, and then you book an, another time for three to five, then you have that room without there being an overlap. So if you have this room, nobody's waiting in the other room for the cameras. If you book it from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. and then from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pretty, pretty simple, right? Uh, translate. OK. Yeah, I can so, hop up to Javi. And let me just touch on a couple things, too. We'll kind of tag team it here. Cool. So related to the staff, so again, as I mentioned in those work groups, some of the areas that others are working in. So. Dustin will be working a lot with us in the four higher area. So when we get projects from businesses, and in the early stages here, we need to produce some videos to promote the four higher services we have. So that's going to be a lot of the work Dustin's working on. Nikki will be working quite a bit on the branding end of what we do. And so she'll be spending a lot of time working on promotions of the channel. And then as time marches on, they will also work with four higher and commercial production as well. And Tamisha, as you know, has done a lot of the back end work, creative work, so she'll be working on brochures, some of the items we need up front on an ongoing basis related to selling things or for hire or for our branding. And also she does a great job on project management. So she's going to be working very closely with me, not only in the create area on managing some of the projects down here with Javi, but also in the other areas in news, sports, and the city productions we do as well. We think if we have someone really working with us in project management, we can improve and make those areas efficient as well. So those are where some of those people are going to go. And related to the time slots, Javi, again, a two-hour time slot sounds a little different, but I bet some of you are old enough and been here long enough as I have to know that back in the day it was two hours, mm -hmm. right? So this is something that we're somewhat going back to. Is that right? That's right. So the way we have our time slots for city times, we are from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. So it's two hour time slots. Um, it, it was done before. So that's what Barb had told me and everything ran smoothly, especially they moved to three hours back in the day when we had to adjust the lighting and move the big ladder. And start but now we're kind of lucky we have a light board. We could light up anything we want. So we're cutting that time in little by little. So two hours is pretty much what we're going to be working with. So is if there is the need of a larger production that might need longer setup or have a band or something along mm -hmm. that line, what's the process there if someone says, I just don't know if I can do it in two hours on occasion? So in that case, I know that some Big productions happen during Saturdays or even during the weekdays. So we would ask them to submit a form. I think those have been sent already. Some applications uh, for those time slots. Uh, if you haven't received, if you haven't received one or gotten one in the mail, please let us know. We're, we we want to make sure that you have it uh, with you or have it filled out. And I think the deadline for that will be, I think it's December twenty second at five p.m. So. Do people have this? And if you don't, we can make this available. But this is what the form looks like. And it's pretty self-explanatory. But if you need some assistance as you go through it, and again, Javi, this would be for regular time slots. So if people want to set up a regular time for studio That's or correct. for editing, you need to go through this. If you're not looking to set up a regular slot, you wouldn't need to do this. You just call in or go call through room share on re a regular basis, and you can schedule things that way. That's correct. Yep. So you said Correct. So how long does that last? What if you don't know on December 20th? What if you know in March that you're going to want a regular time slot? Then does that, can you, is there times at, when you can get that in? At that time, uh, then you would be able to look at the slots that are available and make a regular time slot at that point related to the slots that are available. Would that be correct? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. So certainly that's not the end of setting up a regular time slot. It's just the deadline here, somewhat of a lottery system is what they have talked about to be able to set up the initial time slots because the hours changed. But then after that, if we needed to add additional ones on, if new people came in and produced programs, you bet we would, we would just add them in at that point and look what's available. 
Yep. I think I saw Greg raise his hand. So these time slots that are for two hours? That's correct. You get the control room and the studio yep. for the full two hours? That's correct. Okay, that's what I want to know. All right. All right. Oh, and is everybody re-choosing uh, their regular time slot? I mean, well, these th forms for, let's say, we're impacted by Mondays. Mm -hmm. But if I had Tuesday at 1 o'clock, will I have to re-choose that? Or do you have that time slot by default? Well, we're going to have to look at what is submitted to us and see what is available. Okay. So, uh, like I is said, we won't know until the 26th then? until everybody's application is sent in. So. Yeah, okay. And yeah. We're using multiple time slots on one day a month. Will that option still be available? Uh, like I said, once the, uh, the submissions that come through, we're going to look at what is available and hopefully everything kind of um, makes sense when we look at everything and give everybody what they need. But again, we can't promise anything because we haven't received anything yet. So, Let me clarify. I, th I think I know what you're doing. So you're coming in once a month and producing two, three, four programs. Four is that correct? So that, that's a good point. Are others doing that same type of situation where you're coming in one time and producing multiple shows, Baby Blue Arts is as well? Okay. Well, the main thing is when you have a band in here, it takes two hours to set the band. Correct. In. So you're going to need at least a four-hour slot. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that's something I know staff has talked about, but that's an interesting point as well. And so that's something that we can certainly take a look at if you are coming in one time and producing multiple programs. Obviously, if we're producing four half-hour programs, can you do that in two hours? I don't think that's going to happen. The math does not work out. So good point, and, and we will take a look at that too. Will that be just on a monthly basis, not someone that would come in weekly and, and book multiple slots, two, three, four hours of programming? We, we're granting people, um, f uh, so you have, a total, before it used to be you only get six hours a week for studio time, and that's when we had, everybody had three hour time slots. We're granting people four hour time slots a week. So depending how we, depending how you actually use those throughout the week, um, you could break those up or you could use them all at once. Like it says, like the big productions, you have those four four hours in that one day, or break them up in that one week. It seems to me that those editing hours may get filled up real quick and we'll be waiting to get in. The editing hours are going to vary. Um, that's still kind of up in the up in the air. If you still need a one to five, let us know. You can still book those on Rushare. It seems to be time consuming for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to also put out, um, I was, I was going to say, there's, since the crew is starting, to, or the staff is going to get, you know, a little short, I would say there's a lot of things that we're, we're going to pull back from, which is making DVDs after productions, you know, uh, after productions are done, um, filling in in random spots of your production. Usually we kind of run in the studio, press record, set timer, make sure you're, Everything's looking nice and clean. We'll still do that. We'll set the lights, set the key. But there's certain things that we, we just can't wait there for a minute till your production is over so we could press stop. So that's we're kind of uh, going back on that or walking away from that. Um, also, um, helping like stuff with uh, social media. I think everybody has a grasp with social media. So I, I think we're going to start walking, well, not walking, but kind of letting you take over that on your own social media because a lot of times we help people on their YouTube, on their Facebook, and um, just trying to help them with that. So we're going to let them figure that out and then we'll move from there. Um, Javi, question on that. Would there be training opportunities? So if I'm not YouTube savvy mm -hmm. and I'm going to be expected to do this come January and into February, yep. there's an opportunity well, that I could maybe sit down with you or someone to well, learn the nice, this? Well, the nice thing is that we have such a awesome group of volunteers and All members. Could help. <laughs> so if you know anybody who knows anything about social media and you want to you know, help anybody out, please let your neighbor know. Uh, if you don't mind me name dropping your name to another volunteer, you could probably show them how it's actually done. Almost like a mentorship. Right. If you actually want to participate just a little bit more, help us out. That'll be awesome. Maybe there might be something in it for you too. 
Uh, maybe an extra token, who knows? Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that yet, but you know, just throwing out some ideas just to yeah. make it easy on everybody with the new transitions coming in 2020. Yeah. You have a question on the staff. Did you say uh, Trudy's going to be helping with uh, productions now, or how's that? She's going to be doing doing more of the scheduling, programming, and playback. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you're just the only one on staff now. Uh, yeah, um, you'll see me. <laughs> Let me. I, I well, can mention during the during the month of January, what we're going to do is we're going to have Dustin, Nikki, and Tamisha each work a day. So during this transition period, we can help Javi out, kind of mm -hmm. see how things smooth out over that first month of the new hours. But you're right. At that point, after that, Javi will be the key person. We felt it was very important to always have two staff people in the studio at all times. So again, that's why Trudy will be working more of the front desk, doing more of the clerical oh, work. He gets sick. Then we have <laughs> Dustin, Nikki, and Tamisha that obviously know how to do it and are able to help out. So good point. Mm -hmm. And we've thought of that too, yep. of what would occur in that situation. So I would recommend here in the rest of December and in January, if you have some questions related to some of the points about the DVDs or again the social media, to catch up with Javi or catch up with Dustin, Nikki, or Tamisha at that point and just say, okay, this is coming. What do I need to know? What's the most efficient way to do it? And I'm sure they can help you out with that. Yep. And regarding uh, Javi's kind of off cuff mentioning mentors, I mean, we, we kind of mentioned this in the meeting with you guys. Yep. I think it is, there are a number of volunteers here that have a great wealth of experience and a lot of knowledge that I think they would be willing to come in and Great. share their Great. their knowledge and help other uh, other producers get things done. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you for that. I know we did talk about that and I think we will take you up on that. I think also if, if a newer volunteer needs to figure out how to organize in advance of a show what they need to do to get done in a two hour slot, it's gonna take planning the logistics better than we, you know, we aren't going to have the luxury of mm -hmm. doing things. We need to plan B-roll ahead of time. We need to maybe script it more so we know okay. that we're going to be able to fit in our show. Um, I certainly am willing to help people um, organize stuff like that because that's what I do. Quick show of hands of how many people might be willing and able to help in that capacity of assisting others if need be? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think so. Excellent. I think I Paul's hand Quick. Oh, Trudy, <laughs> did you get that on video? <laughs> 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 I was just going to suggest, Sue Ellen, when you're talking about having uh, new people who are coming on to learn how to get their productions squeezed down to two hours, it may be true that initially they won't be able to do that, but maybe they'll be able to uh, get a portion of their show created and then come back to another time slot and finish mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. right. Good thought. Yep. And, uh, all right. What about being open to volunteers who live outside the area? Oh, that's a good question. At this point, that would not be something that we would look to change. Because again, as the cities support this, it is the nine cities that are a part of this, and we think the first right and the privilege goes to the community members. So at this point, no, we would not look at that as an option. And again, as we've talked a little bit through the meeting, I think with the new schedule, time might get a little tighter, and I think that would be the last thing we want to do is compromise some of your potential time here locally to open it up to others. I just want to throw out the idea. Um, what we have is four days a week, four sessions a day, so that's 16 times four weeks a month is 64 productions a month using one or the other studio because we only have one control room. But if we take the portable studio, we set it up in Edit Suite 5, and we can do productions in A and B simultaneously, that doubles us to 128 in house productions a month. And I know a lot of our productions are not a lot, but some of them are done at churches and whatever and don't even use the facility. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that we could have two control rooms and double up our production time? 
Jotted it down. That's, that's a good thought. Yes, how could we utilize? There are productions that only use one camera. Yeah. And do you need the whole studio to do a one camera production? Would there be a way to potentially utilize other equipment like the portable studio to get that done? Very good thought. Yeah. Very good thought. That's why we wanted to meet with you as well, to get some of these ideas of, you know the equipment, you know the day-to-day -day use of the facility along with the staff, and so that's good. That's good. Dave, uh, you had mentioned as far as the city supporting us. I have a comment, but first a question to clarify. Um, did I understand correctly that the cities, other than funneling the money that is from the cable fees, they don't actually contribute any city monies towards this, this entity, is that correct? That's correct. I don't know if Mike's still back in the control mode, if he wants to answer, but that's okay. correct. Okay. The, the money that comes to us is money that comes through the franchise fee and the peg fee, but no, there's nothing in the city's budget per se that a portion of the city taxpayer money comes to us, no. So I guess based on that fact, I'm wondering if maybe somehow the public portion of this, the access, has maybe gotten a little out of balance. And the reason I say that is because if the monies are really coming from the subscriber fees and not the cities, but yet you've got a quorum of your board that are city managers or city employees, you've got the, the bulk of the resources going towards the cities, Where's the balance as far as what's really for the access part of public access as opposed to being a PR wing for the cities? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll let Mike talk a little bit about the board because we have talked about the makeup of the board and looking at what some other organizations do as they turn this corner to have to think more outwardly and think about fundraising and some of those things. Does it make sense to have a board with a different makeup? That's certainly a possibility that we've talked about. Related to, if you look at the whole pie of CCX Media and where it goes, actually the largest portion goes to the news, which would be for the entire community, not specifically for the cities, with the hope that people will engage and watch CCX Media content, and as I mentioned earlier, would lead to sales and sponsorships. Closely behind that would be the sports production because again we produce a lot of the high school games and again down the road that's something that we can sell sponsorships. We've already worked with Chick-fil-A and some other businesses that have been interested in doing sponsorships of our sports productions. Then the cities and the create are the next two. The city's portion as far as the staff that works with the city content that we do we have part-time people that are at the city halls that actually crew the meetings on the given nights. But we have one coordinator of the municipal productions that actually works with all the equipment, hires the crew, maintains the crews for all of those meetings. And then we have three people that work with the connection, that work with the city content that we do. So really the city portion of what we do as far as staff is for, and I guess maybe a, a third of me, goes into that pie as well. So that's really the size of what's working with the cities and that commitment back to keep them happy with what we're doing and supply them with some content. And so does that answer? And related yeah. to the board, Mike can answer right. on the and board. Right, and the cities decided a long time ago when they first started is that they were going to keep basically hands off on the, on the news product that we have here. Uh, they're not telling us what to put on the news or, you know, sometimes we do stories that aren't so favorable uh, to the yeah. cities. And it is, they made that decision a long time ago. And so, I mean, it puts us in, you know, some interesting walk on eggshells every now and then, but we do what we feel is needed in terms of a journalistic perspective. But Dave is 100% correct. Uh, the portion that goes into producing programs, and you call it like the kind of the PR uh, side of the cities, uh, is is probably one of the smallest portions in, the, in terms of the entire organization. I know it's smaller than the create operations, uh, just doing um, you know various programs through the connection program that Dave's involved with. And the board question related to that is as we move forward, we're going to be seeking, uh, we're gonna have to look at board members that have say, you know, maybe nonprofit experience, some business experience, you know, go beyond just, uh, you know, municipal um, representation, but looking further out from uh, other nonprofit organizations, so forth and so on. Uh, but the money, that, the, the, the funding itself is the city's money. They could take it away tomorrow if they want and put it into their general budget. We don't want that to happen. It's happened in 
quite a few cities, even here in the Twin Cities, where they just took the franchise fees and said, you know, you're not serving us in any way, and then and they just kept the money. And that's the last thing we want to have happen. Mm -hmm. The last thing we want to have happen to break up the consortium of cities uh, would be an absolute disaster uh, for us. So. Um, we do have to still try to do the things we've been doing since the very beginning. Um, and again, um, our goal is to keep, cru yes, there's some changes. And when we went through our whole strategic plan, I said to folks, you know, it's one thing to do a strategic plan. It's another thing to implement it. Implementing is hard. It's very hard. And it's not, it, nothing's perfect, but, you know, we're one of the organizations that actually has a plan to keep this going. And that's what you got to look at the bright side of things in terms of that. You know, yes, there might be less capacity, but if we are, you know, I heard various efficiency issues and things like that here. And, you know, Scott's idea, I mean, there's all kinds of things with, 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 uh, that have come out of this meeting that sound very interesting and possibly doable in terms of this. Uh, so that's why we really enjoy having this meeting right now. But, uh, but the board makeup will change over time. And just to be clear, we have two governing bodies that we work with. So right. There's maybe explain that we have a cable commission that administers the franchise, and then we have a board of directors that works with the community television operation. So that is correct. There's two distinct bodies. The commission is members of the city. Andy is a part of that group. So those are representatives from the cities that make decisions related to franchise and are more of the monitors of the cable company, if you right, will. Right. And then the board of directors works more with us related to CCX programming. Any other questions? Boy, we kept you late at night, I didn't we? Mary LaHaye has a question. <laughs> uh, Scott's idea is really great, except for in one case, which we did have this issue. We're going to get you a microphone, Mary. Why don't you just repeat your question here? It's coming. Um, Basically, doing a, a, a production in both rooms A and B at the same time, you have to keep in mind you cannot do a music show in right. one mm -hmm. <laughs> because you cannot yeah. film in the other one without the music going into their audio. And this has happened, so that is something that if we do do something like that, it's going to have to be with the understanding that it has to be like a talk show or something right, that program. isn't. Right. Yep. Right. Over, yes, yeah. And I just thought I'd bring that up because we did have that issue where we had A reserved and then uh, B was given mm -hmm. to somebody with drums. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. the yeah. conduit right. under the floor is, is great for cables and efficiency, but for sound, it's not the best yeah, thing in the good. world. So we've been talking about that too, yeah, of are there options, but I think you're right. Careful studio scheduling might be the easiest way to make sense of that, you're right. No other questions? We wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, this has been a very worthwhile meeting. Um, I wanna thank Dave for all the work that he has done uh, working with staff. Uh, thank all the CREATE staff. And, 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 a, and a person who's not even here in this room right now, who's been a real, uh, kind of the glue of, of community TV, somebody we're gonna miss. Uh, and her name has not been mentioned tonight, well, maybe her first name, but Barb Nolan Clark. Um, I just wanna say, uh, if Barb's watching on Facebook Live, you know, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're gonna miss you. I mean, it, it's hard, it's, it, it's really sad that, uh, you know, I know Barb will be happy in retirement, but I've worked with Barb since day one. Um, she's been uh, one of our longest, one of the original Four, now we're down to three, myself, Dave, and then Tim. Uh, Barb was the fourth person of the original employees that started here back in the early 80s. And so uh, we wanna thank her uh, for all that she's done. And certainly, you know, she'll be here until Friday. So if you haven't had a chance to say goodbye, certainly, you know, uh, come on down. And uh, we've got cookies, I think, Trudy. You did some, a cookie run. There's a few uh, things out there. And some other things. And so, Again, thank the CREATE staff for the work they've done and congratulate the people that are gonna be working in some of those other key areas. And give Javi a big hug yeah. here, because Javi, 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 Javi. <laughs> Javi. <laughs>
Javi kind of on the spot tonight because, again, we've talked about some of these changes, and so Javi's been working hard with staff related to the slots and things, so this is really his first chance from a public standpoint to talk about something that might bring up some big questions. So, Javi, nice yeah, job. Thank you. And, again, mm -hmm. work with Javi closely on this related to your scheduling of the studio slots and certainly related to the mentorship and some of the other opportunities. I'm sure he'll appreciate it, and I'll stay very close with Javi related to the operations and some of the work and create as we move forward to make sure things are working how they should be working and take any questions and comments you have. So as far as dates to remember Javi, so the key date is that December 22nd at 5 p.m. related to your time slot choices for editing in studio. That's correct. So if you have any questions related to that or you need the form, certainly see Javi and the staff. Trudy I'm sure has them as well and we can make sure you get through that process. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, Have a wait, great one, night. One oh, more Andy, question. One more? Andy. Member of the board, I certainly want to thank all of you for all the work you've done. You did an excellent job explaining it tonight, and all the work and effort you put into it. So as a member of that board, I want to thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Andy. We really we appreciate, appreciate that. that. And he's been a long time cable commissioner and he understands what we're all going through. He's been seeing all this and, and he knows and, and I appreciate that. That uh, yeah. you know, none of this is easy. Uh, change is hard. But we think we've got a, a plan moving forward that's going to sustain us uh, for the long term because that's what we want to do. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming.